Good day, everyone. I'm your host, Mike Lasecki, and today our topic is getting everyone on the same page, practical strategies for evaluator stakeholder communication. Let me remind you that this webinar is being recorded and you'll automatically receive a link to the recording. We'd like to thank ATE Central, the information hub for the National Science Foundation's ATE program, for making this webinar possible through their webinar hosting services. You can learn more about them from the URL atecentral.net. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the evaluation hub for the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate serves the ATE community and others by holding webinars on evaluation like this one, maintaining an open access resource library, curating a blog about STEM education evaluation, and collecting and disseminating data about the ATE program. Be sure to, vi to visit the Evaluate website. You can see it right at the bottom of the screen. Visit that website to learn more. NSF's ATE program is focused on improving technician education, mainly through two-year colleges. It funds projects in high-tech areas like advanced manufacturing, engineering technologies, IT, and nanotechnologies. The slides from this webinar are already on Evaluate's website, along with a handout with key points from the webinar. In fact, at any time during the webinar, you can access these materials by clicking on the word webinar materials on the middle right of your screen and then browsing to them. This will open a new browser page. Make sure you come back if you're off doing that. As I mentioned, this webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be emailed to you in a few days. That's me on the right left hand side of your screen. I'm Mike Lasecki. I'm with Luca Partners. I'll be the moderator for the webinar today. Melissa wilson Becho and Kelly Robertson from Evaluate are our presenters. We'd like to, on this next screen, recognize our colleagues who have worked behind the scenes to help bring this webinar to you today. They include Emma Perk and Lori Wingate from Evaluate, Cynthia Williams, she's Evaluate's editor from Style Sheets, and working with me here at Luca Partners are Jana Pinhorn and Shanna Payne. Thank you all. This is a good time to acknowledge the support from the National Science Foundation and to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. And now it's my pleasure to turn things over to Lissa. Go ahead, Lissa. Thanks, Mike. Well, we are really excited today to talk with you about communication and evaluation. But before we jump in, we want to do a quick poll. So as Mike said, you're going to be using your hand raise icon, which is located in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. So go ahead and raise your hand if you are an evaluator. I see hands raising. All right. So it looks like um, about half of our participants today are evaluators. Great. Mike, go ahead and reset those hands for us. So once Mike resets the hands, there we go. On the next slide, raise your hand if you are a principal investigator or other project staff, including a grants manager. So as a reminder, the hand icon is in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. All right, I see hands going up. Great. So it looks like another group of us are our project staff. Well, wonderful. So we do want to point out that our webinar today will be speaking to everyone who plays a role in the evaluation process, including evaluators, project staff, and even grants managers. Communication is a two-way street. So Mike, go ahead and reset those hands for us. So in order to start thinking about communication and the role it can play in evaluations, we want to share with you a few scenarios to see if you have experienced something similar in your own um, evaluation practice or in your project. So go ahead and raise your hand if you have ever been confused about the purpose of an evaluation activity. So this can be applicable if you are a project staff or if you are an evaluator. I have to admit that as an evaluator myself, I've gotten confused between my projects and wondered why we're doing certain activities at certain times. 
So if you can relate to this scenario, go ahead and raise your hand. All right, it looks like maybe a third or a fourth um, have really experienced something like this. Mike, let's go ahead and reset those hands. So our next scenario, um, raise your hand if you have ever received a piece of evaluation data too late for it to be useful. So if you're a project staff, this could be an evaluation report past the deadline, or if you're an evaluator, maybe receiving data from project staff too late to incorporate it into an evaluation report. It looks like even more of you, almost about 40 of you, have experienced this as well. So Mike, go ahead and reset those hands for us one last time. So our final scenario is to raise your hand if you have found out found that the final evaluation report didn't really address important project needs. So if you're an evaluator, you might realize this is the case when your project staff have a lot of additional questions about the evaluation report, or maybe even seem disappointed in its contents. So it looks like a little bit less of you have seen that, which is great, but wonderful. Thank you so much for engaging in those scenarios. So all of these situations really could be avoided with good, clear communication between the evaluation team and the project staff. In many ways, good communication is the secret ingredient to a smooth, effective communication. A smooth, effective evaluation. So if we look at the four main steps of an evaluation, it can be easy to think that communication between the evaluation team and project staff is only important at the beginning when you're deciding on the evaluation questions. But good communication is important throughout the entire process of an evaluation. Clear communication is needed at the beginning of a project to align the purpose and scope of the evaluation. It's needed at the data collection period where the, the program staff can help gather data and help the evaluation team reach project participants. It's needed in order to really interpret the evaluation findings with validity. And finally, it's good communication is needed to report the results in a way that is clear and useful to project staff. So good communication throughout the evaluation really is essential. And this good communication between the evaluation team and project staff helps to clarify expectations about evaluation activities, timelines, and deliverables. It helps to strengthen evaluation capacity within the projects to increase buy-in um, about the evaluation process and the evaluation findings. And finally, it really helps to increase the final utility of that evaluation. You want to make sure that your evaluation findings are being used and useful to the project. So overall, good communication leads to good evaluation. So now that you're all excited about improving your communication strategies, let's take a look about what we're going to talk about. So today, Kelly and I want to share some strategies with you that we've developed through our own practice. Besides working with Evaluate, Kelly and I collaborate on a number of smaller evaluations in nonprofits in the West Michigan area. These programs are in the areas of intergenerational anti-poverty efforts, empowering black male youth, and serving black survivors of trauma. So these evaluations really tend to have smaller budgets, but really engage stakeholders. So throughout our work together, we have come up with strategies to keep track of these smaller projects and keep the different groups of stakeholders all on the same page. So in this webinar, we want to translate our learnings from these evaluations to the ATE context and share with you some real life examples from our work and hope that they can inspire some of your own work. So let's take a look at how what we're going to talk about through the rest of the webinar. So the webinar is split up into three main sections, communication before the beginning of your evaluation, communication throughout the process of your evaluation, and communication at the end of the evaluation. So each of these sections will have a question break at the end. So if a question pops into your head at any time throughout the webinar, feel free to write it in the chat box, and Mike will save them up and ask them during one of our three question breaks. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Kelly to get us started. Hello, I'm Kelly. I'm going to talk about some strategies for project staff and evaluators to use when communicating during the negotiation stage before you have a formal contract in place and after the evaluation contract has been signed and the evaluation and the project kick off. So good communication starts at the first meeting. Because there's a lot of information communicated at this first meeting, we recommend that both evaluators and project staff have a list of key questions prepared to ensure you get answers to questions that are really important to you. But before we give you some of our go-to questions, we wanted to hear some of yours first. So in the chat box, please list what evaluators need to know from project staff at the first meeting.
Yeah, so here's some good ones. You know, what does success look like? What will be your deliverables? The purpose of the evaluation? How's data going to be used? What have been your previous experiences with evaluation? Those are all really good. How will the findings be used? The budget? Yeah, these are really good. There's so many questions to ask. So we're just going to present a few of our favorites. Um, so asking why a project wants an evaluation conducted now is usually a good way to get at the purpose of the evaluation, the source of the demand for the evaluation, and also how the evaluation is intended to be used. Asking project staff how they'll know if the project is successful or not, as some of you have already mentioned, can reveal a lot about project goals that may or may not have been made explicit and helps get project staff to start thinking evaluatively. Identifying challenges that are anticipated with implementation can reveal information project staff may not have thought to disclose when they were giving a project overview and may identify topics the evaluation can help inform. It's important to know how project staff want evaluation results communicated at the start. And it might be helpful for evaluators to provide examples of possible reporting formats. It's also important to note that sometimes clients don't know what they need until they need it. So it might have to be a question that you ask multiple times. For example, recently at the beginning of a meeting with a client, Liz and I asked if they wanted us to create a one-page document to accompany the annual report we had recently submitted to help you know, facilitate the use of the evaluation, and they said no. And then later in the meeting, they told us that they were going to go present to the city and request for some additional funds for the project. And so we again offered to create a one-page summary. And because you know, they were right in the middle of talking about an instance in which they need it, they took us up on the offer. Now let's switch gears. In the chat box, please list what project staff need to know at a first meeting from an evaluator. Deadlines. Deadlines are very important. Um, how should we communicate? What will you need us to do? An overview of the process. What's your approach to evaluation? That's really important. Um, how will the results be reported and organized? I think you know getting at those details is helpful. The time commitment from project staff, that's a really good one. And when was the last evaluation done? Yeah, those are all really important. So here's a few of our go-to questions we would definitely want asked, answered if we were meeting with an evaluator. So we recommend asking about how often you'll be in contact, because contact should occur regularly and not just around reporting time. And asking a question like this helps get a conversation around communication expectations started out early. It's important to ask how the evaluation will ensure the evaluation will be how the evaluator will ensure the evaluation will be responsive to a project's audience and context. So being responsive means that all evaluation activities and data collection instruments are appropriate for your participants. An example of this might mean, let's say, not using online surveys with a population that has low access to the internet. So when assessing an, uh, an answer to this question, what's really important is that project staff have plenty of opportunities to review draft plans and instruments, because only project staff can accurately determine whether what's being implemented is appropriate for their context. It's important that project staff get a draft report in time to make comments before a final report needs to be submitted to NSF. It's also important to make sure that project staff have the evaluation report before they have to submit their annual ATE report so that project staff can use data from the evaluation report to complete the annual report to NSF. The majority of information about an evaluation is typically communicated via written reports. And it's important to see an example report to make sure a similar report would meet project staff's needs. Plus, it's a good tool to use to discuss what it is that project staff do and don't like about reports in general, and maybe that specific example. Also, just as a side note, sometimes evaluators aren't able to share reports that they've created for other clients. 
And it's also important to establish upfront whether recommendations should be created as part of the evaluation process. And this is something that should be determined by the project staff and the evaluator before the evaluation begins. And if, if recommendations are going to be created, it's important to identify how the recommendations will be generated and by whom. The evaluator, project staff, both. So after the first meeting, once the evaluator has basic information about the project's evaluation needs, then they can start putting together a proposal and the cost estimate. But when project staff aren't sure what they need or don't know how much evaluation activities cost, one option is to use a budget menu. So a budget menu outlines the potential evaluation activities and then pairs these with potential benefits, uses, and price. The menu allows project staff to see different options and choose which activities are right for their needs and that fit their price point. And this is something that can be proposed by evaluators as well as requested by project staff. So here's an example of an evaluation budget we created for one of our projects that I'll walk through to discuss the components. So first we provided an overview of the general purpose of each bundle of services we were proposing. Then we highlighted key activities and deliverables of each so that they could be easily compared. And then we explicitly outlined the pros and cons of each of the proposed options. And I think this part is really helpful because especially for project staff who don't regularly think about evaluation design, you know, just briefly outlining these pros and cons brings project staff on the same page quickly, which can facilitate their engagement and buy-in in the process. So you've heard about the importance of using an evaluation matrix from Evaluate before, but it's always good to say again. So an evaluation matrix helps communicate evaluation activities in a clear way, and it increases This transparency. Kelly, it's Mike, and Steve. we've your audio has become intermittent. Between evaluation let's, questions colleagues, and Colleagues, let's just hold on a second. So presenting the information the in a table especially makes it easier to read than uh, having it just written out, which forces the readers to sort of guess at the connections between the questions and data collection components. An evaluation matrix can also help uh, communicate information to project staff quickly, which is really important because project staff can't fully participate in a discussion about evaluation design if they can't see the whole picture. And then the larger hope is that if project staff participate more in the evaluation process, it'll increase their buy-in and use of the results. So an evaluation matrix can be used in a scope of work for a contract or an evaluation proposal that's created after the evaluator has been contracted. They're similar to a data collection matrix but differ in that they link methods to evaluation questions and ideally evaluation standards. While the exact content of an evaluation matrix can vary, here are some columns that we usually use. We always suggest organizing the matrices by evaluation questions because evaluation questions are what guide evaluation, so it makes sense to use them to structure a discussion about design. We also make a point to always include subheadings that explain the purpose of each column in everyday language. And not every matrix has to look like this, you know, each one should fit your context. But you can also mix and match the columns to fit your needs. So for example, to save space, we'll often combine data collection methods and data collection sources. So here's an example from one of our projects. You can see that we organize the matrix by evaluation questions, which are located in the solid rows. So we find it helpful to engage project staff and other stakeholders when generating a detailed evaluation plan after the contract has been signed and really throughout the entire evaluation process. Engagement of the project staff in the evaluation process helps to build their buy-in, which leads to more involvement in the evaluation and confidence in the results and hopefully increased use of the evaluation. While evaluators may have evaluation expertise, Regardless of whether evaluators have experience with similar projects, it's the project staff that hold project expertise. 
and you need a balance of both evaluation and project expertise for quality evaluation. So in the past, after a first meeting with a client, when presenting a draft evaluation plan, we often found that project staff assumed what we were proposing looked good or was correct because we're the quote unquote evaluation experts. But to help engage project staff more in this stage, we now started framing things by telling project staff, you know, we listened during the first meeting, and this draft just represents our best guess of what we think is right for your project. But you are the project experts, and we need your critical eye to make sure what we're proposing is going to work. And so we found that when we emphasize the important role project expertise plays, that our clients become a lot more engaged. It's important to have a communication plan established at the start of an evaluation after the contract has been signed to set expectations. And now when I say plan, I don't necessarily mean anything formal. It can be as informal as notes and meeting minutes, but what is important is that you establish a few basic guidelines. And Evaluate has a communication plan checklist that can be accessed online and is listed in the webinar handout. So it's important to designate primary contacts for both the evaluation and project. While well, often multiple people on each side will need to be in contact, it's helpful to identify the people that should always be CC'd on emails and kept in the loop from the start. Once, uh, oftentimes there's a lot of contact in the beginning of a project, very little in the middle, and a lot at the end. So it's important to keep in regular contact to keep the evaluation process moving and to keep the evaluation team in the loop of important project changes. You know, often without any prompts, that project staff won't think to update evaluators on changes that could impact the evaluation because they're hard at work implementing the project. So to, help, to keep more consistent communication, we suggest setting up reoccurring meetings ahead of time at the beginning of an evaluation because it's easier to cancel a meeting if it's not needed than to schedule one in a crunch time. It's important to set expectations for what, when, and how project staff will provide input on the evaluation. For example, identifying what they'll review, instruments, plans, reports, uh, when they'll be reviewed, how far in advance project staff want these documents, two weeks, one week, three, three days, and then also how, they, how the evaluation team wants to receive feedback. You know, should it be face-to-face, -face, should it be via email? And finally, it's helpful to identify who's responsible for disseminating evaluation reports. And in ATE, usually this responsibility lies with the PI. So in summary, some of the strategies we recommend when it comes to communication before and at the beginning of evaluation include preparing a set of questions to ask at a first meeting to make sure important information isn't overlooked, to present evaluation options in a budget menu when project staff aren't sure about what they want or don't know what to expect in terms of costs. Again, this is something that can be requested by project staff. Use an, evalu use an evaluation very much, Kelly. to clearly Kelly, during one of your presentations, we had a brief uh, glitch in the audio system, questions. but I think we should be able to again, recover that on the uh, audio section. We had, a, I think, for about two slides, it, it jumped out, but I think we should be okay there. So I just want to let, to yeah, just want to let our colleagues quality. know that we should be able Great to formal or capture that on, correct that on the video. But here's a question for you, Kelly. Um, people like to use logic models today, and one of our so participants says it it's too a early break. to bring up a logic model at this stage. Uh, what do you think? Oh, no. Okay, so bring it up early and often. I think that sounds like a good idea. Here's a second question from one of our, uh, our colleagues. Um, you talked about this budget spreadsheet. What if somebody asks for something that's way beyond the scope of the budget? Do you, do you, just, do you just simply say, hey, we can't do that? Or I don't think so how, at how all. Do you I usually ask if the project like already has a logic model and usually um, try to outline that and present that you know, if possible, as part of the evaluation plan. So no, I don't think it's too early.
Okay, perfect. It's probably a good strategy to use that menu and just as your discussion point. That's a good idea. I mean, idea. I think it depends. I think Here's the another question, and let me turn back to Lisa to give you, you know, a break you there. The um, Lisa, what's the best way to hone in to on the program theory, especially if a really client care, you know, might what's be not know what a program theory step. is or not clear on to it? Show, how can you, you, know, how can you help hone on that? Any advice there, Lisa? And maybe deliverables are involved. Certainly. I think clarifying program theory is one of maybe the hardest jobs that we do as an evaluator because I think a lot of time project staff and evaluators haven't always taken the time to take a step back and really think about what is the logic underlying the activities and the intended outcomes or impact of a project. So I think a lot of it is about asking reflective questions and really having an in-depth discussion with multiple um, people in the project staff to get different perspectives and build that program theory. Good, good point. You know, colleagues, you can see a number of us are are not only asking questions, but giving comments in the chat window. I think what we're going to do now, Lisa and Kelly, is move forward into the next section. We'll address some of those questions later, and some might be addressed by our colleagues uh, as well in that window. So let me advance forward and ask you, Lisa, to take us into that section where we're now throughout the evaluation process itself. Great. Well, thanks, Mike. So like Mike said, now we want to share some strategies about communication throughout the evaluation process. So Kelly talked about multiple strategies to organize your evaluation plan at the beginning of an evaluation. So these evaluation plans are such useful documents for both the project staff and the evaluation team. But how many times do we just file these away once we're done creating them? They end up somewhere in a room that looks just like this, right? Not very helpful in the day-to-day -to, -day to the evaluator or the project staff. So instead, one strategy that we have found helpful is to distill the most important parts of your evaluation plan into a one-page, what we call a cheat sheet. So this cheat sheet is a one-page summary of the important evaluation details. It can be used by project staff to remind them about upcoming evaluation activities, report due dates, or the general scope of the evaluation question. Kelly and I often bring these cheat sheets to meetings with project staff to serve as a quick reminder. We've really found that it's quite helpful in getting people on the same page in a quick manner. This way we don't have to go through all of the technical details at the beginning of every meeting. Instead, we can just jump in and talk about the important matters at hand. It can also be really useful for evaluation team members to remember the upcoming milestones of an evaluation. So like I mentioned earlier, Kelly and I work on a number of smaller evaluation projects, and I know this is pretty typical for other evaluators. So not sure about you, but in busy times, evaluation activities and timelines, they all tend to get mixed up in my head. So I like to keep the one-page cheat sheet for each of my projects pinned next to the wall of my desk. So here you can see I have my three projects, and just a quick glance at these can really help remind me, you know, why, whether we intended to do a focus group or an interview or whether we're doing convenience sampling or success case sampling with a certain project. Just really helps to keep things clear. So let's take a look at what you should include on this evaluation plan cheat sheet. So since it is a communication tool, there are a few details that you should always try to include to clarify communication. So first, include the date that is covered by this cheat sheet on the top. So you don't want to get confused between this year's plan and last year's plan. Just the date always clarifies some things. Second, we like to include the phone numbers of key project staff and evaluators. This makes it really easy to pick up the phone and call someone when anyone has a question. So next, if you update the cheat sheet throughout the year or in between years, make sure that the changes are clearly marked. So try using a different color or calling attention to the new items with an asterisk. Uh, we have forgotten to do this in the past, and trust us, it makes uh, forgetting it makes things very confusing. And finally, remember to include a last updated date on the bottom. You can easily add a field to the footer of a Microsoft Word document that will automatically update this date every time you save the document. So it's a really great way to make sure that everyone has the most up-to-date version. So what should be in the body of a cheat sheet? Well, this should really be tailored to your audiences and the uses for a cheat sheet. But here are some ideas of what you might want to include. So first, you might consider including a summary of deliverables. So some of our evaluations require multiple reports throughout the year. 
each with its own focus. So when this is a case, it can be really helpful to include a summary of the deliverables matched with the evaluation questions that they address. This helps to align the expectations of the project staff and the evaluation team so everyone knows which questions will be answered in which reports. You might also consider including a timeline of key collection activities and report deadlines. So this could be just a simple text timeline with major milestone dates. However, we find that including small icons for each activity, especially when they're repeated over time, can help the user easily digest the information at a glance. It just makes it more usable. Also, don't forget to include the due dates for your reports, but also we like to include the draft due dates so that project staff can know when they should expect upcoming drafts of reports. Finally, you might want to include a shortened version of your evaluation matrix. So as Kelly explained, the evaluation matrix really can be the heart of your evaluation plan. So why not condense it for your cheat sheet? So you can see here we've chosen to identify the different methods in this evaluation along with who is responsible for collecting them and when they will be collected. So we also like to include this sample for each data collection method. And again, this is just a quick reminder for both evaluators and project staff to refer to throughout the evaluation. So I want to pause here and ask uh, your opinion. What would you find really helpful in a cheat sheet like this? Are there any other additional pieces of information you think would be essential to include? Or is there really something about an evaluation that you tend to forget or need to look up really often? So what else might you include? Use the chat box to respond. So I know we talked about a lot of things. So besides the deliverables, the evaluation matrix, and the timeline, let's see, a products list, right? So like what are the main products that come out of this? Data collection schedules are really important. Um, a grant fiscal year, that's a really great one, Carl. I think that um, gets confused a lot, especially when you're bouncing between projects. Uh, the project's own deadlines for reporting. Ooh, Stephanie mentions any travel dates. I think that's really important too, right? So when will project staff be unavailable? When will evaluation staff be unavailable as well? Evan mentioned including key stakeholder groups. That's a really interesting idea to make sure that everyone knows who should have an influence on the evaluation. Great. Well, I see more ideas are coming in, but I think we're going to move forward. So thank you all for those ideas. So like we previously discussed, you will have a set communication plan early in your evaluation. However, project staff are generally really busy with carrying out the activities of a project and will not have time to dedicate to an in-person meeting every month. Kelly and I try and meet with our clients about quarterly. So to avoid gaps in communications in between these meetings, we found it really helpful to send out a monthly email update. So these emails are straightforward updates to keep everyone in the loop of what's going on with the evaluation. No one wants to feel like they don't know what the evaluation team has been up to for months. So while we like the, evalu the cheat sheet to be really colorful and polished, the monthly email is a simple, straightforward text in the body of an email. No need to open attachments or remember to look at a web document. We suggest that you create a template or a structure for these emails that conveys the information you think is most important to, to talk about each month. So the standard structure like this from month to month helps make the email updates easy for stakeholders to skim. Everyone knows what to expect and where to look for the information. You can actually easily set up an email template in order to maintain the same headings month to month. So things you might consider including in this monthly update email might be a summary of the evaluation activities that have occurred throughout the past month, a summary of upcoming evaluation activities for the next month. This email update is also a good time for evaluators to remind project staff of any tasks they may have in the upcoming month, whether this is a data exchange or reviewing of an instrument. And finally, it's also a really great time for project staff to tell, tell the evaluation team of any changes that have happened in the project. We have found that asking about changes in the project on a regular basis really help to avoid any last minute uh, issues or things with the evaluation down the road. All right, so it can be really helpful to share evaluation findings as soon and as often as possible. Sharing preliminary findings can really help to increase the use of evaluation data for program improvement, increase ownership and buy-in in the evaluation process and findings, and again, increase the validity of the interpretations and of evaluation conclusions. 
Kelly and I frequently tell our clients that if we're doing a good job in communicating along the way, there should be no surprises in the final evaluation report. So sharing preliminary findings doesn't have to be something really complex and scary. It can be as simple as sending a few bullet points in an email and asking project staff to reflect on it. We have also actually included some data in tables. So this is pretty straightforward. You can see one, two, three, and have the, the preliminary results and bring this piece of paper to a meeting and really discuss them through with this project staff and stakeholders. Finally, you can go something a little more in depth and you can create a monitoring dashboard to share at quarterly meetings. So while some of these suggestions don't require additional report on the evaluate, additional work on the evaluation team, um, others such as this dashboard really do. Dashboards like this can be really great and useful to project staff in responding to data requests from upstream. For example, when a chancellor or a VP asks for the most updated numbers on your grant, However, if project staff are really interested in something like this from the evaluation team, it's really important to discuss it up front so it's included in the initial scope of the evaluation. So a quick summary before we head to the next question break. So don't forget, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat box now. So strategies that we have discussed to increase the communication throughout the evaluation include Summarizing your evaluation plan into a one-page cheat sheet in order to easily reference evaluation details. Sending monthly email updates to avoid long gaps in communication. Share preliminary results as soon and as often as possible. And avoid any surprises in the final evaluation report. All right, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Mike for our question break. Thanks, Alyssa. Will you go back a couple of slides to that dashboard? Sure. Here you go. So a number of us really like that. You just did that in Excel. That is all done in Excel. Wow. We're going we're to have to talk to you about how that looks really good. It is a one page that's very <laughs> tight. It looks really nice. So several people um, uh, commented on that. Let me ask you another question. We just couldn't resist doing that. Save, the, save this up for a minute because oh, we like to look sure. at it. Um, you mentioned meetings, right? Meetings with your clients. So how important is it to do these face-to-face -face or virtual? I mean, can't everything be done virtually today using some web interface? Do you ever need to meet face-to-face -face with a client, assuming that there's budget for a meeting like that? What's your sense of the ratio of face-to-face -face versus virtual interaction? Certainly. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people like to do everything via email nowadays, which is great to have a written communication track. However, I think talking about the complexities of evaluation and making sure that everyone is using the same vocabulary and everyone means the same thing, it's really important to have a conversation. So whether that's on the phone, via video conference, or actually in person, I mean, personally, me, I, I really like to have at least one in-person meeting with clients. I find that it just it adds that personal aspect to it. You get to know them, they get to know you, and then all communication from there on out seems a little bit easier. I even find that when um, I know our clients for sure are busy all of the time, and so sometimes even phone calls will constantly miss them because they're out in the field. Um, working with their participants, and so, you know, if we can swing by, it just makes some things easier. Sure, I think that's right. Um, let me ask you a, a sort of related question, right? You've set up this great communication with your project staff, and darn, the principal investigator or one of the key players changes. They, they go on vacation to Hawaii for six months. How do you recover from that? Do you start over? Have you had any experience like that? <laughs> that is a great question. In fact, this just happened to Kelly and I in the past week, is the oh. fact that our main contact at a project um, was shifted out to a different person. And so we were very glad that we had things like our evaluation matrix, we had the cheat sheet, we had the history of monthly email updates, because we could really just transfer all of these files to the new project um, point for us and say, please review all of these, and then we'd love to set up a meeting and talk with you. So I think uh, having all of these details in writing really helps when project staff changes over. And even Which, evaluation staff can change over as well. Right. That's inevitably going to happen, isn't it, as you just pointed out? Certainly. Very interesting. One of our colleagues wonders if you would change your communication 
let's call it style or, or method if you're dealing with an internal evaluation part of the project versus, uh, you know, if, if, if projects, if you're dealing with, let's see, is it you're that's dealing with the internal evaluators? Well, that's what I'm, I'm thinking. The question is, do you recommend any different communication techniques for internal evaluators? Yeah, I think sometimes it can be almost harder to be an internal evaluator. I think there's this assumption that it's easier to be the external because an internal is, quote, always there. But at the same time, you know, you don't have that external uh, perspective. Also, you know, you may not be invited to meetings that you need to be at. Um, so I think in terms of just a constant open chain of communication, but also kind of setting up these meetings to say, you know, we really do need to talk about evaluation. It can't just be included in an additional meeting. Yeah, I think that's true. Okay, uh, here's the last one. We're, it's somewhat of a tongue-in-cheek tongue uh, question, I think. What do you do when clients or stakeholders don't respond to your communications, right? You try calling them, you're leaving voicemails, they don't respond to emails. Do you assume they hate you or do you assume they're just too busy or it went into their spam? Any any things you could advise us? Yes. Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is not to assume that they hate you, is to recognize that they are also very busy. Uh, right. I've never had a situation. I mean, we have situations all the time where we have difficulty contacting someone or, or hearing feedback from them, but it is always because they are busy. And unfortunately, sometimes evaluation uh, gets left to the end of the list. True. Right. So I would say um, uh, particularly upfront in the evaluation of talking to project staff to say, what is your preferred mode of communication? I think some people like okay. email, some people like phone. So having that agreed upon from the beginning and just hearing their preferred mode of communication is helpful. Um, and then, like we said, having uh, set recurring meetings from the beginning, I think, can really help with that. Because it's, like Kelly said, it's always easier to cancel a meeting if you really feel like you don't need it instead of scheduling a meeting last minute sure. um, in, in a type of crisis situation. You know, all of us relate to your comments there. We appreciate your, your practical advice. Let's go forward into the next session. Let's turn back to Kelly. Now we're, we're at the third section of the evaluation towards the, the end of it. Go ahead, Kelly. So hello again. So here are some strategies for communicating at the end of the evaluation. So writing an evaluation report takes a lot of time. We're like actually in the middle of that right now. We need to send it out in the next day or two. And it utilizes a substantial portion of the evaluation budget. So it's important that the evaluation and project staff are on the same page before the report is drafted to help align expectations and hopefully save future headaches. So we recommend sharing an outline of the report before they're drafted. And I have to admit, I was sort of resistant to this idea at first because I assumed it was sort of repetitive because everything in the report is mentioned in the proposal. But then I got thinking to thinking about it. And there's actually a really big lag between the evaluation proposal and reporting, especially for project staff who aren't regularly thinking about the evaluation. So here's an example, just a very basic outline that's organized around evaluation questions and lists the data used to answer each question that we used with a client. Here's another example of an overview we provided a client that highlights differences between two upcoming annual reports. And so we've been working with this project for several years, so we also used asterisks and italics to highlight how each report would be different from the norm given our new evaluation activities in the current contract. When going over evaluation reports, we like to ask two sets of reflective questions. We ask questions that get at needed revisions by asking about the accuracy of the report and the degree to which it aligns with project staff's expectations. We also ask questions that get at next steps for the evaluation and expectations for future reporting. So here are some of our go-to reflective questions when it comes to trying to identify revisions. So asking about overall impressions is usually a good question just to help open up the conversation. Asking about surprises is important because it can help highlight some potential learning from the evaluation. Asking whether there's content project staff disagree with can identify potential areas where more contextual information is needed or identify potential errors. 
For example, in one report, after representing the frequency of two different activities, one of which was really low, we learned that project staff started counting both activities as one activity midway through the year. And, you know, they were busy doing what they're doing and didn't think to tell us, and this isn't something we would have known until it came time to go through the report and ask this question. Asking whether there's anything confusing sounds basic, but it's important to make sure everything's communicated clearly. Oftentimes the evaluator is so close to the data, it's hard to make sure that it makes sense to others. And you know, while some of these questions overlap, I think it's okay because it's hard to remember all of your comments uh, you know, on such a large document at once. And these overlapping questions are designed to get project staff's most significant comments. So it's okay that they overlap somewhat. So in terms of questions focused on evaluation next steps and future expectations for reporting, we like to ask what aspects the project, uh, what aspects of the project need improvement based on the report, and this can help generate some recommendations. Hopefully this next question was covered during evaluation planning because a response could end up impacting evaluation budget, but a response could also help be used to inform evaluation activities for the next year. Identifying staff's unanswered questions can help establish what additional questions could be answered going forward. And asking project staff what they want to see next is helpful because sometimes you don't know what you want or what's possible until you've seen an example. So a quick poll. So often recommendations are just listed in bullet points like in example A, and the justifications for these recommendations isn't included. Another way to present recommendations is in a table format, like an example B, that links the recommendations with evidence that justifies these suggestions. So my question for all of you is, which format do you think will result in increased evaluation use? And please respond in the poll, which just appeared. Okay, it looks like a majority of people think that um, presenting the information in a table and pairing it with justifications will increase use. Great. So, and again, while this isn't widely done, we believe pairing these will increase use. And so we recommend pairing evidence in tables for both conclusions and recommendations when possible. This will help clearly link the judgment or suggestion, sorry, my, my, my link did not come on cue. <laughs> Anyways, it'll help clearly link the judgment or suggestion with evidence from the evaluation, which can help increase buy-in of findings and hopefully eventually use. So here's another example from one of our reports. We identified the action, which is to create an action plan to improve instructional content. And then we identified the why, because feedback forms indicate participants are saying that the material is only somewhat helpful and not very helpful. So as a way to facilitate communication between evaluation iterations, regardless of whether the evaluator remains the same, we recommend documenting suggestions for future evaluations within the evaluation report. Because evaluators might change, and even if they don't, it's helpful to document the problem, why it's a problem, and what specific actions are recommended. And it's also helpful for communicating expectations for future evaluation with project staff and to get their buy-in before the next phase of the evaluation begins. Again, this is something clients can request from their evaluator. So here's another example from a report. So first we identified the problem. The feedback forms weren't yielding helpful information. This problem came about because the feedback forms were designed to inform content development, but now that the content's fairly well established, the questions aren't as useful. So our specific recommendation is to add some satisfaction items, implement the form less frequently, and add a question to learn why individuals aren't participating in alternative therapy. And so I think it's especially important not to be vague, especially when it comes to the action, because this is the information the current or the new evaluator will use to implement changes. So in summary, when communicating at the end of the evaluation, 
Share report outlines to set expectations for reporting. Ask questions that get at both revisions and next steps for the evaluation and future reporting. Link evidence to conclusions and recommendations and tables to increase buy-in and use of the results and recommendations. Documenting suggestions for future evaluation is helpful for both evaluators new and existing to the project. It's also something project staff can request. So just to wrap it up, our overall takeaway is that good communication is essential for good evaluation. It helps clarify expectations and increases stakeholder buy-in, which ultimately increases the utility of the findings. And evaluation use is really the entire point of the evaluation process. So I'll hand it back over to Mike for some more questions. Thanks, Kelly. Let's jump right in. There's a flurry of interest in the in your presentation in the chat, Kelly, because when you put up that <clears throat> that recommendation thing, right, that showed what you were suggesting, number of people suggested, why not add suggestions for implementation of those recommendations? Lisa, you've been chatting with us in the in the chat box. Let me turn to you for a moment. Is that a good idea, or you are you stepping to where a project should take over the implementation? I mean, what's what's your sense of that, Lisa? Why don't you come on and talk about it for a minute? We'll give Kelly a chance to catch her breath. Sure. I mean, I think it's definitely a balancing act. I love uh, Virginia said that it's a great opportunity to work with project staff in order to help them fill out that implementation column. So I think. You know, and it all goes back to scoping and setting boundaries up front of what is the role of the evaluator and what is the role of project staff. Um, but I think there's so many ways that evaluators have this really unique lens and way of thinking that they are really valuable in terms of action planning, the next steps in terms of implementing recommendations. So I think that's true. I, I remember one time I was involved more from the project side and the evaluator was was making these recommendations and they were like going too far. It was, it, she was imagining that we had all this money and we had all these personnel and it didn't work for us at the time. So it was a bit awkward. I didn't really know how to handle it. Have you run into anything like that, Lisa? Well, and I think that can be the, the downside of an evaluator being involved in implementing the recommendations or suggesting how the recommendations should be followed is that they don't have that uh, expertise of the project. They don't have, yeah, uh, right. you know, the intimate knowledge of how things work within that project or organization. Well, good. Thanks for those comments. Kelly, let's turn back to you. Here's a question that came up in the chat. Okay, so you're at the reporting phase, you're an evaluator, and your project has a widely diverse group of stakeholders. Do you actually create separate reports or maybe the target one group of stakeholders or you just try to provide for everybody? How do you do it? You know, I think it depends on your budget. So ideally it would be able, it would be great to um, be able to create different reports. Um, you know, I think there's things you can do within the report and how you organize it. So maybe you only include a few uh, details about methods in the actual report body and some more, you know, the more um, the technical information in the appendices. So you can sort of, you're still keeping that same level of information, but you're kind of gearing the report body for an audience that may not want to, you know, know all the technical details. Um, so, you know, you can also create one page reports and things like that. You know, just one really uh, sort of short way that we've done it is we've, um, when we send a report, we send, you know, the full report with the executive summary, report body, and appendices. And then we also save the executive summary as a separate document so project staff can quickly access that. And then we'll also save the report without the appendices and send that sure. along. Just because sometimes I think people may not know how to like break up, you know, PDFs and once they see those page numbers, it might be overwhelming. So that's just a quick, easy way to go about it. Good. That, that's a great suggestion. Thank you for that. Let me turn back to Lisa. And Lisa, here's some, these are hard questions. So I'm just going to let you know that in, uh, from the beginning. What do you do if your recommendations encounter a denial? You know, you don't have that right. I mean, it's obviously it's going, this is going to be a communication issue, right? So have you run into that? What do you do? 
I, uh, I was looking for the question just to clarify whether or not the project staff completely disagreed with the recommendation or found it not realistic to implement. But again, I think it's, it's building trust with the project staff, between the project staff and the evaluator, which happens all the way through, right? You can't just build trust within a day at the very end, particularly if there is some political debate around recommendations or even conclusions. So talking about when it should be face-to-face -face or digital, I think this is definitely a face-to-face -face conversation. Yes. And really digging into the assumptions behind why they don't buy into that recommendation. Because perhaps there's something that you don't understand as the evaluator, or perhaps there's something going on in the program that you weren't aware of that it doesn't fit. But I do think there's a fine line between standing your ground as well as an evaluator to say, this is what came from the evidence. And, and that's another good point, making sure that your recommendations are backed up and very clearly linked to the evidence that came through the evaluation data. Another question related to this, let me, I'm gonna paraphrase the question a little bit. So this, this information is going to be passed on eventually to the funder, right? So I guess there's a communication issue. Do you ever run to this? You know, what, this sounds funny. What should we tell the funder? Or what should we hold in, to ourselves? I don't know. That's a tricky one, isn't it? You know, I think, um, you know, it depends on the funder um, and what they're expecting from the evaluation report. You know, I was in a situation before where, the evaluation report recommendations weren't expected. Um, and so, you know, we didn't include those in the actual report that was sent to the funder. And then I included recommendations in a separate document to the actual client. So that's one option. Well, that's not bad. That's not a bad idea at all. Excellent. So let me just uh, look at our timing. We're almost perfectly on time here, right about the top of the hour. Let's go ahead and remind folks of what's happened today. They can get all of the access to all of the materials, the slides and, and the handouts and everything from that link or by clicking on the thing on the right hand side. There it is. Thank you, Alyssa, for putting it in the chat window. We really appreciate that. Listen, and uh, Kelly, I just want to comment that so many people in the chat window found your information so valuable today, especially your practical experience speaking from your own experience. We found that to be very valuable. So colleagues, we now are going to ask you an evaluation question, right? We're going to ask you to help uh, complete our own survey to help us improve these, um, these um, webinars as we go forward. The last thing before I launch this, we had a lot of experience with the, uh, the hand raise today, right? So folks, I'm going to encourage you to go up into the hand raise, use the pull down menu and give some applause to our two presenters. So thank you. Oh, look at all those applauses coming out. Isn't that great, Lisa and Kelly? Thank mm -hmm. you again. Okay, folks, here I go. I'm going to launch the survey. Some older Macs uh, won't actually activate the survey, so we'll put the link in the chat window as well. Thank you for joining today. Uh, with the launch of this survey, it will open in a new browser window. Hold on just a second. There we go. Okay, sorry. There we go. Now I've launched that survey. You should see it in a new browser window. And again, I will place it in the chat window if it doesn't open for you. Thanks for joining today. That officially ends our webinar. Goodbye, everyone.